We are talking John Hughes films with Dave Sundstrom next on Retro Serial. Hey everyone, this is Ian C. I'm glad you could be joining us for today's program. On today's program, once again, we have returning guest Dave Sundstrom from The Good Stuff. Yeah, we're going to be talking all about John Hughes films, The Brat Pack, and overlapping issues in regards to growing up Generation X and all those good movies that we saw that defined us as a generation. However, we're going to get straight to that interview. But before that, if you wouldn't mind, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Those two things, they mean the world to me. Really helps us out a lot. If you want to go an extra step further, please share it on your favorite social media. Let everybody know about all the good content that you're getting here at Retro Serial. Also, if you want to know when these things come out, hit the bell notification. And if you want to part with some of your hard-earned cash, follow the link below to the Buy Me a Coffee page where you can donate some money to building this YouTube mogul empire. If you're listening to this on podcast, please like it, review it, leave a star rating. That helps us tremendously. With all that said and all that in mind, let's just get straight to the interview with Dave Sundstrom from The Good Stuff, talking all about John Hughes films. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, I am on the line here with David Sundstrom from The Good Stuff. How you doing, Dave? I am doing great. How are you, Ian? I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good. good. I like the uh, saying, uh, better than I deserve, because that's certainly the truth for in my case. I mean, I am doing better than I deserve. It's, it's true for your case, too, but I'm not going to judge you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we both we both live pretty good lives, don't we? Ah, uh, yeah, totally, totally. Um, so uh, tell everybody out there about your channel to start off with. I think, I think everybody who subscribed to my channel is a is a result of your channel of you recommending people to me. But uh, in case there's one of my followers who don't know who you are. <laughs> Please tell everybody about your channel and what you do over there on the good stuff. Yeah, I just talk about music, movies, and mostly television mm -hmm. from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So my most recent video was all about Mary Tyler Moore and Dick Van Dyke and their special relationship that they had while they were uh, making the Dick Van Dyke show in the early 60s. And it was, you know, I just love those stories. I yeah. love stories of uh movie making television shows from an era gone by and i'm not you know we're not going super far back but to my youth which is i'm at the very tail end i think i am the last year where one can qualify as a boomer mm -hmm. and then a lot of gen x type shows as well and uh so we cry i definitely our interests they merge intersect from time to time well yeah for sure and then what came out it, during the boomer generation affected me because Absolutely. i watched it growing up yeah. and i loved the reruns yeah and <laughs> i love the mary tyler or not the mary tyler moore show i don't love that too but i love the dick van dyke show yeah I, I i i didn't know until i watched your your show i actually was under the impression that they were married kind of like a lucille ball yeah kind of you know i didn't know a that lot of folks were yeah yeah. I, yeah I did as well i thought that they were a, truly a couple and turns out they were definitely very very fond of each other and even uh they have admitted to being attracted to each other but uh according to them nothing ever came of it, it other is, than some really great tv right right it's it's difficult it's almost like today when you see uh well, it, it's over now, but more recently, when you see uh, Jim and Pam on The Office, yeah. I mean, they have such great yeah. chemistry, and they've talked about that before. You know, um, uh, the the actress who plays Pam Beasley, boy, I'm forgetting the name, but I remember her character name. Uh, she says she becomes Pam when she gets close to to Jim. She becomes that character when she gets close to John Krasinski. It's just something that happens. So yeah, if some 
some people have great chemistry. You don't have to force it. Some people have awful chemistry. Uh, we won't talk about that. Though. <laughs> we'll get into it. We'll jump right into our subject matter because I want to have you on the show because we are going to be talking about there's nothing that defines Generation X probably more pronouncedly than John Hughes Films and the Brat Pack. Yes. Behind you there is a collection of John Hughes films and the, and the Brat Pack, and we're going to be talking all about it. Now, uh, I know you're kind of at the beginning generation of Generation X. You, like you said, the end of the boomer, the beginning of Generation X. So it's always interesting to me to kind of see how films hit people differently. Because yeah. uh, as I was a kid, I was growing up, all these people behind you in the films, the characters they played, I don't know about their real life situation, but the characters they played were all older than me. And I looked up to them. And for you, they're probably either around the same age or a little bit younger than you um, uh, is when the films came out. Uh, I, you know, I, in 1985, uh, like when the Breakfast Club, Club came out, for example, um, were you still in high school? If you don't mind, I mean, I'm not dating yourself oh, or whatever. I graduated in 82. So I, you know, I was still felt like a high schooler. Right, right, right. I still feel like a high schooler sometime, but you know what I mean? I it was I was recently removed from that environment. So I still identified with them, but yeah, they they were a few years younger than me and at least their characters were. I yeah. suspect the actors were my age or even a little older. Right, right. And so as so so with that in mind, let me just ask you, how did, did how did it hit you when like as you as you recall um, some of these John Hughes films with obviously a lot of them being focused around kind of older teenage problems. Uh, uh, how did that hit you? Did, did you, do you feel like you like really identified with it or do you like look when you watched it for the, which watched them for the first time, did you look back and say something like, boy, that's kind of lame. That's kind of like, like if I look back now at it, you know, some, at some of it, I like, oh, that's kind of, I don't identify with that anymore or whatever. Or did you think John Hughes was nailing it in these films? I really did. I thought he had a, just kind of a, a, his finger on the pulse of what was going on in terms of youth of America and Bra or the breakfast club, for example, mm -hmm. I, you know, each character is very different. Right. And I think we've all encountered characters like that in, in our own uh, high school years during our own high school years. And for that reason, I, you know what, the interesting thing is, is I had, I identified with none of them, but characteristics of each of them I mm. identified with. And that's for me, that actually even made each of those characters more appealing because I could see a little bit of me, in each one. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. So uh, let's just lay it out here. Tell me if I had to, uh, it's probably hard to choose, but if you had to choose your favorite John Hughes movie, uh, what would it, what would he, what would it be? Oh, wow. There's been so many, right? It's really hard to pick. Uh, holy cow. Uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. Oh really? That is a, that would that that's an interesting one. Uh, what what was it about planes, trains, and automobiles that you think is uh, it, it makes it kind of stand out for you? I know you have to you have to make a decision, but you know I'm right. forcing you to make a decision. But yeah, so I like a lot of John Hughes movies. Don't get me wrong. There's uh, many of them that I've enjoyed multiple times over the years, but that one probably, if I were to think about one that first off, it has two of my very favorite actors in it. Yeah, Steve Martin and John Candy. And at the end of the day, I just like the message about from that movie uh, around these two fellers, very different people, but they had similar goals. Uh, and that goal is not while well, one, the overt goal for Steve Martin is to get home in time for Thanksgiving. Both of them have goals to be loved and appreciated and 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 you see that play out over the course of the two hours or so that uh, that uh, the movie plays out for. And I, I just it's it's hard to describe why that one is my favorite other than how I feel at the end of the movie. And, yeah. and by the way, John Hughes has a way of making people feel good at the end of movies. Uh, it seems to be a lost art. It seems like every movie I watch these days. 
it ends and I go, wow, that was a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> well, doesn't anyone believe in a happy ending anymore? Uh. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and John Hughes believed in a happy ending and a warm, kind uh, ending where people uh, learned something and became better because of whatever the experience was that transpired in the movie. And that certainly is the case for planes, trains, and automobiles. Yeah. There's, there tends to be this uh, character arc uh, in, in, in a lot of his films where the, the, the characters in the film learn and grow uh, through the film um, to like, it's almost like a, a better, like a good ending, but also it doesn't compromise reality either. Mm-hmm. You know, Breakfast Club for me is a prime example of that. It's not, I think, for example, John Bender is a better human being by the end of it, but it's not like it It has this fantasy that, you know, suddenly Daddy, Daddy Warbucks comes and rescues him from his horrible life or something like that. You know, it's really, um, it, it really is a, a, be- a good ending, but not an unrealistically good ending. They all kind of learn something. Uh, and I think that's important too. We, we, we've lost that a lot and being able also to just really, you know, put yourself emotionally into the shoes of people. Uh, I did notice that with trains, planes, and automobiles, even though those, those characters were, weren't just teenage characters I was looking up to, they were adult characters, but I could totally understand that here's this guy who lost his wife and here's this guy who wants to get home to his family. And I think we, and even though there are some times where you can't necessarily put yourself in the in that person's shoes like you haven't been through that, but you can understand it. You totally understand it. You totally get it. Yeah. So uh, let me put you on the spot. I know you're doing the interviewing, but... Uh, oh, it's okay. Favorite, it's a conversation. What's your favorite John Hughes movie, Ian? Uh, you know, it's really stuck between a couple of them. Um, it would, I would say that probably The Breakfast Club stands out the most. Um, uh, yeah, I would say that one, uh, weird science kind of takes a little, little bit of, of a second position, uh, Ferris Bueller's day off a second position, um, and, and 16 candles are kind of all be tied for third or second. Uh, but I think if there is a one that kind of edged out and hit me most emotionally when it came out, it would have been the breakfast club. I really tended to identify, with a lot of the characters, which is interesting because when you chose planes, trains, and automobiles, um, like there's, there, it's not a, it's not a Brat Pack movie, mm-hmm. you know, it's an adult movie, but uh, it's, but in these other ones, they were all kind of Brat Packers that kind of came together. It's interesting. I don't know if I, you know, the Brat Pack movies actually transcended J- John Hughes as well, right? There were a number of Brat Pack movies out there. The one that immediately comes to mind is St. Elmo's, Elmo's Fire. John Hughes had nothing to do with that movie. Uh, but the actors were considered the Brat Pack. Right. Uh, but when I think about my favorite John Hughes movies, most of them weren't the ones that were, and maybe this does have to go with the fact that, you know, by 82, I was out of high school. Uh, for example, I love the vacation movies. Now yeah. critics hate them. What? But, a, what? what a critics, <laughs> are, right? Seriously. <laughs> National Lampoon's vacation, that first one. And I, and I, uh, Christmas vacation has a special place in my heart too, just because mm-hmm. I watch it every year, every holiday season. Uh, but those movies with just the genius of Chevy Chase leading the madcap chaotic comedy, those those are some of my favorite movies as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, Vacations in heavy rotation. I love Vacation, that original one. There really is a... Uh, I like the second one even, but it's not, it's not quite up to snuff as the first one. But I didn't hate it. You know, a lot of people really hated it, but I didn't hate it. Loved the third one. Thought it was hilarious. Uh, and, uh, and then the, uh, uh, and then uh, Vegas vacation, I thought was good too. Yeah. Did you like it or no? Did you not like it? it? It was okay. Vegas vacation. I don't think Hughes had anything to do with that movie. I oh yeah. Yeah. I forgot. We're, we're but it about... was the characters he helped create. Right. So. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, it's funny. Do you know the story behind why they have different kids every time? 
No, but I appreciated the running gag that, that they were always different kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess it was because um, uh, uh, Michael Anthony Michael Hall w- didn't want to do the second one. He wanted to be in Weird Science instead. And so then they got Jason Lively to play him, which I think he did. I mean, he kind of looks like yeah. Anthony Michael Hall, kind of a lookalike kind of a character. And then the, the girl wanted to come back as the sister, but because they, they replaced Anthony Michael Hall, they said, well, this will be funny. We'll just replace them every time. So they <laughs> replaced them. Did jo- I didn't even know John Hughes. Did he have uh, something to do with Christmas vacation? Yeah. He wrote it. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't he know. He wrote that. all of the vacations. Uh, well, he wrote the first three vacation movies. Yeah. Yeah. And let me think. He Did he direct any of them? I don't think he, he did direct any of them. He was just the writer for all three movies. Yeah. Yeah. I th- thought that the character that kind of stills the show for me in those is mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> is uh, the um, not Dennis Quaid, Randy Quaid. Randy, Randy Quaid. Cousin I, <laughs> yeah, cousin Eddie. He is so funny in those shows, and he's one of those funny characters that you just you want to strangle because yeah. you love him so much. Just yeah, just doesn't understand his boundaries whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely great character. So I have some questions for you. That now I know that that now and again you pointed this out and it's so true. And then fire back at me. Let's you just make this a conversation too. Yeah. Um uh fire back at me any anytime you want to as well. Um because you just you already said that they, that uh, uh John Hughes movies kind of overlap with uh Brat Pack movies. Um, and, uh, and I know I want to focus on, on, on John Hughes, but I also kind of want to do kind of teenage, you know, if we go off the rails or something like that, it's not, it's no big deal. So if I were to ask you what's your favorite Brat Pack movie, what would you say? Oh, it would be the breakfast club. Oh, okay. All right. It would be yeah. the breakfast club. It would club. definitely be within the John Hughes, uh, r- realm of movies. Now I do have a, uh, I don't know if it's a Brat Pack movie, but I, I really liked it. Around the same time, there around the same time there was a movie called Just One of the Guys. Did you ever see that? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I love that movie. I, yeah. In fact, I just watched it again last year. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just because I was doing a, a little bit of research, I thought about doing a video on the. I think her name is Joyce Hauser, the gal that played the main character that masquerades as a boy. You're right. Right. Uh, and. Uh, so I watched it again and it's, it's, it's not great, but it's, it doesn't <laughs> have to be great for it to be one of my favorite movies. And so, right, right. That's well, a, and that wasn't, I guess, you know, I don't know if it's a Brad Pack movie or just one of those teen comedies from the early eighties, but that was one of my favorites. Back yeah. That, that was a good one. Let's go ahead and say that again. I think I saw that one in the th- in theater like three times. I enjoyed oh. it that much. Did you see any of these in the theater? Oh, I saw all of these in the theater. Oh, did you? Actually, I take that back. So, you know, I I, uh, was raised in the Mormon faith, LDS faith. I was on my mission during Ferris Bueller's day off. Mm. So 85 to 87 is a bit of a, uh, I had to catch up Mm. Mormon missionaries. I don't think that the LDS church likes being called Mormon anymore. So LDS missionaries are now, uh, or, or back then, and still aren't, I believe, allowed to go see movies and that kind of thing while they're serving. And so from 85, we're talking about, think about this. This was, I had to catch up on Pretty in Pink, mm. Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Some Kind of Wonderful. I think those were the the biggies. I think I caught Weird Science uh, right before I left to go serve my mission. So I caught that one. But uh, there was Hughes was on a tear. I, know. I was missing out on all these great movies. Hearing about here when I heard about Ferris Bueller's Day Off, boy, I wanted to see that one bad. <laughs> Did you want to see that one really bad? Thank heavens, you know, yeah. I got home and was able to just like you know, my parents while I had been gone had finally uh, decided that it was okay to have a VCR in the home, so we bought a VCR. Uh-huh. They bought a VCR, and so I just hit the rental store. And I was just like, I was in insanity probably for a good month, just renting three, four videos a day, just <laughs> catching up on all the good movies. 
Yeah, I could imagine. I could imagine. Uh, I went on a, a, a missions trip as well, a little bit different, but I was gone for yeah. a good, uh, a, well, mine was only six months. So it was three months Still of a long time, Still three months of, time. and this mine was in the nineties, yeah. but three months of, of lecture phase. And then there was three months of, of outreach. And, uh, and I remember that too, kind of coming back and readjusting to the world and re and I, one of the movies that I actually rewatched during that time was Ferris Bueller's day off. Cause I mean, you're just kind of out. You're, I mean, I, you're not watching anything. I was on a mission compound mm-hmm. in Texas and I mean, you're not really watching anything, you know, you're getting up and you're going to your classes and stuff right. like that. And, uh, I, you know, this is going to sound a little, little weird and, 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 and believe me, it's not preachy or judgy. That's not what this show is yeah. about, but I could not believe after three months of, of not watching anything. Then finally somebody came back. We were allowed to like go to town and stuff. I don't know how it is at the, at the LDS church yeah. or anything, but we were allowed to like go to town, like whatever we needed to do and come back. But just your life wasn't, I didn't have a job or whatever. My whole life was there on this missions base. Well, we came back with some videos and one of them was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And I couldn't believe how dirty it was. <laughs> like literally after being away for three months, uh, you know, like just listening to the Bible and lectures and stuff like that. I was just like, oh my gosh, the guy's saying GD. And <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a fair share of uh, profanity in, in most of these, of these movies. Right. You just have to, you know, if it bothers you, you can choose not to watch it or tune it out. One oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 I mean, it just take, took me no, unfortunately, probably not the best thing in the world, but unfortunately it didn't take me too long to get back into it. Right. I was going <laughs> to say, uh, the sad part is, is now I don't even hear it. I'll watch a movie that's you yeah. know, laced with that stuff. And, and my wife or someone at the end will say, you know, boy, there was a lot of swearing. I, I, was there? I yeah. didn't hear any of it. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, I had a friend and now when a Ferris Bueller originally came out, this is kind of interesting. I had a friend who was blind. Uh, and, uh, he had an accident and, um, he and I used to skip school time before his accident. I was a bad kid. I was not a good kid growing up. I was, I heard you were a bit of a rebel. I was, I was a bit of a John Bender, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, um, um, he inspired by the show called <laughs> the school <laughs> pretended to be my dad <laughs> and 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 asked me to come to his house and nice. like like he's to come to his house you know what i mean because he he at that time he was blind so like he was home he went to blind school but then he was home but he during at his at his house he called and said he was my dad and said he needs to go over to his friend's jeremy's house his, his he's blind and he's going to need some attention so if you could excuse him from school <laughs> and he tried to do his best grown-up voice now i don't know that's a good friend that's a good <laughs> friend you got Ian. that is a good friend let me ask you this question though because you you brought up breakfast club what draws you to breakfast club what what drew you to that uh that show as opposed to weird science or fair well actually there's a similar thing one of the things that really draws me to hughes's movies are are, it's the soundtrack the music right yeah i mean i know that he when he wrote the screenplay play for pretty in pink he was listening to psychedelic first day and night and using that as inspiration kind of as a muse for him as he wrote that and one of the things that they do they're really good about is whoever's the uh person that's in charge of selecting music for the soundtrack to go with these movies they're it's just phenomenal mm-hmm. it's just phenomenal if you think of those three movies for example uh all of them have moments where you can instantly recollect the music it's playing and the images that are associated with it. It's that good. Uh, in addition to the music, the cast, right? Yeah. These are well cast movies. And you, you look at these movies now and you can't imagine, at least I can't imagine anyone else in those roles. It's that perfectly cast. I wouldn't want anyone else. I don't even want to play that game. Well, who, what if they were to reboot this movie or remake it? Mm-hmm. They don't need to be remade. They're that perfect of, of movies and the casting's that good. Yeah. It's hard to think of anybody else being in the cast the way it was. I'm sure you're aware that uh, Molly Ringwald was originally, 
uh, meant to play the Ali Sheedy character. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I, I mean, literally, I'm sure that, you know, if we were looking back in some alternate universe and it was that way, I'm sure she would have done a good job, but the way it is now, it was, uh, so you, when you see, when you mentioned that you, uh, identify with each of the characters, um, tell me a little bit about, explore that a little bit more, if you don't mind, just kind of go into at least maybe one of them or, or two of them in which, in w- ways in which you identified with them at the time, well, or even we- now. Yeah, I was still, I always felt, still feel like a little bit of a geek, right? So the mm-hmm. Anthony Michael Hall character, I was not, not that I am anymore. I'm my, uh, but uh, when I was in high school, I was a really skinny, lanky kid, uh, barely you know, over a hundred pounds. And so uh, that, that character I identify with a lot, but the Ali Sheedy character, that kind of odd person out, kind of weird, felt that way too. I felt Uh, I was, I was in athletics, although not basketball or football. So I had a little bit of the jock in me, Mm -hmm. not a lot. It was the, the, you know, I, I swam in high school. Oh, cool. And and then I fashioned, I wanted to be the, the Judd Nilsson character. I don't know if I was, (laughs) but the only character that I didn't really, uh, you know, identify with much was the Molly Ringwald character. Yeah. It's hard to identify with her because I mean it's that is such a unique character too. You know the the upscale come right. from a very very rich family and being female, yeah. you know, and and during that time it's kind of a little bit difficult to identify. Uh, but I'm hearing you right down the line. Now, were you ever in detention? Nope. You never I were. Was, I never was in detention. I never got in trouble. Oh, okay. I was one of the luckiest guys in the world because it's not to say I didn't do things that would have got me would not have would have got me in trouble. I did from time to time, uh-huh. uh, but I never got caught, and as a result, never found myself in detention. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in and out of detention, so I literally I do know what it's like to be in detention and to set where the they you can't do anything it's basically like you know you you really can't do anything they don't even well it all it all depends on who's running the detention but a lot of times they won't even let you do homework they really just want you to sit and stare at the wall uh well yeah i i they didn't know what to do with me i was really i don't i don't even think they had detention at my high school i really don't Ian. i mean (laughs) i just don't think they had it (laughs) <laughs> probably if the kids got in trouble, they, they called their parents and let the parents do the discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of nice. That's, that's kind of nice. I agree. I, I, I mean, people looked at me and I look back at pictures of myself and I definitely pretty much looked like John Bender during that time, but I felt on, I, and, and this is part of a, dy- a dynamic, even when it's reflected in music that I've talked about before, um, Uh, But on the inside, I was more like the Anthony Michael Hall character, kind of combined with the Ali Sheedy character, Uh, you know, that weirdo, that 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 bit of a geek. I wasn't good in school, but I was certainly um, I was certainly bright. You know, every every they they tested me every year because I had a reading disability and they're like, man, this kid's reading like I couldn't read. But my memory was like off the chart. They uh, they actually didn't know that I was a bad reader. Because up until like second grade, because I'd be able to recite books when I was a kid. Like they'd, like they'd show me like green eggs and ham or something like that. Like, and they put it back on the shelf and they're like, oh, can you go read that? And I'd pick it up, open it up, start reading it. Like I knew the words and they didn't know that I wasn't reading, that I was just memorizing. It wasn't until they pointed out the word and that kind of haunted me for the rest of my life, not being able to read very well. And uh, so I was kind of a bad kid in school, but I'd, I'd memorize the lectures. I mean, I'd sit there and a, a pet professor would ask me, oh, what did you think about the, or a teacher? I say professor. I, yeah, I've, been, I've been in higher education too long. <laughs> the teacher would ask me, what did you think about this? And I'd be able to recite it, but I wouldn't do it. Ah, I'm out of here, man. I'm not, I'm not going to listen to this. And I'm, I'm going to go smoke cigarettes behind the, the, uh, behind the school or, or, or skip school or something like that. So I definitely agree. I was trying to be John Bender, but I really on the inside was, and that reflected in the music because the music I listened to was all hair metal. But when the grunge scene hit or the alternative rock hit, I really kind of did that, the geek kind of rock kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, but, but uh, now let's talk about the music though, because the music is now simple minds. 
because we did talk about new wave before, but you, you brought it up and I can't not talk about it. Well, what did you, what do you think of simple minds? I like simple minds. Uh, so that song, Don't You Forget About Me, wasn't written by Simple Minds. It was written by Keith Forsey, and it was first offered to Billy Idol. And yeah. I think Billy Idol blew it. <laughs> I think he could have. He was he was hot. And you know what? His career continued to be uh, fairly successful for a number of years. Uh, but, boy, was uh, Jim Carr and the band lucky that that song was offered to them. Because, you know, they had uh, – they had developed quite a bit of, of a following in Europe, mm-hmm. but they really hadn't been able to break stateside until that song. And uh, what a great song, right? Yeah. Even today, you know, I just, I, they did a masterful job of uh, recording it and it's a, it's a true classic. And uh, I never, I I've heard many simple minds, albums and songs alive and kicking is a great song, but that to me is the song that I will forever associate with Simple Minds. And the irony is, is it's a song they didn't write kind of like I love cheap trick. And a lot of people know that band for the flame, which is a song that they didn't write either. Oh, they didn't write the flame. No, I didn't. I didn't know that. Diane Warren wrote that she was a hit maker in the eighties and nineties. And, and uh, as a last gasp, CBS made the band record that song and it became a big hit for them, much to their chagrin. And if you listen to it, it sounds nothing like what a typical cheap Circ song sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's definitely true. There's definitely a, you know, a slower pace, less kind of yeah. poppy sound to it, yeah. but uh, boy, I'm glad they did it. Yeah, I, I think Billy Idol would have done a good job. I can yeah. totally hear it. Uh, Billy Idol, but it did um, turn me on to, Simple Minds, which I didn't really know about before until that song came out. And I believe we even picked up one of their, and they're, they're one of those bands that, you know, they, they, they made a lot of albums, but they just weren't popular in the States. Um, uh, and, uh, and I remember even picking up one in like 95 or something like that. It had a little bit of air time and a little bit of video time to it and going, man, I got to, go get that. And we went down to the re- record store and, and, uh, or the CD store and picked it up. Uh, so I was, a, I was a kind of a fan, not a diehard fan, but I thought that that was a, a, yeah. a great, great one. You know, you, you know what else has a great soundtrack to it. What's and, that? and, and it's kind of one of those, it's one of those people that I don't know if he was necessarily a brat packer, but he was around that same time. And he actually did appear in 16 candles, um, but, uh, uh, and that is John Cusack. Mm. Uh, I don't Are know if he's talking te- about gross point blank. No, uh, great show. Great show. Great I'll soundtrack. Say anything. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Say anything for sure. For sure. Uh, I yes. Sure <laughs> You're getting close. You're getting close. Better off dead. Better off dead. Oh yeah. That did have a pretty good soundtrack. That had a great soundtrack yeah. to it. A lot of people, you know, it's one of those, um, soundtracks that 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 add to the movie and 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 complete the movie and don't necessarily override it but the fix uh, the fix was in the, the one of their songs i'm not sure which one i'm trying to remember which one but yeah i remember that soundtrack now yeah love that movie uh there was two movies that john cusick made with uh savage steve holland the writer director he did Better Off Dead, and then he did One Crazy Summer. I don't loved, know if you remember that. I movie. loved both of them. Well, Many well, movies. <laughs> they were. I mean, I was a super young kid. Uh, yeah. One Crazy Summer is, I put that on my Christmas list. That is a Christmas show. F- not One Crazy Summer. Sorry, Better Off Dead is, Better is, off, a, yeah. is a Christmas show for us because it happens over the holiday season. So yeah. we watch that every year. I, and, I was, and it's kind of interesting because when you look at 16 Candles, and you think uh, John Cusack, he plays um, one of the guys who, who bets Anthony Michael Hall. Uh, and uh, and y- you think about him, like you didn't think he would be a breakout star. I really thought Anthony Michael Hall's career would, would more or less be the career that John Cusack's uh, turned out to be. Yeah. Um, I was a big fan of Anthony Michael Hall, quite honestly. I mean, I, I loved everything he did. Uh, and I think he shot himself in the foot a little bit because he turned down roles. 
he didn't he didn't want to be typecast but then hollywood stopped calling him <laughs> so <laughs> that's really unfortunate all right so let's turn our attention to uh weird science okay okay because i need to know this and this is another perspective uh, me being a, a younger Generation X, you being on the front end of Generation X. What did you think of computers? <laughs> that, like when I watched Weird Science, I really thought that that was real. Like I just, you know, because I wasn't around computers, I didn't know that that stuff wasn't real. I thought, well, man, we need to get a computer and back into the military. <laughs> what did did you think? Did you were you fooled by the '80s overemphasizing of computer technology, or are you writing the the? I think it pretty much. I I had you know, we had a home computer, and I, I I think I realized that there was an element of fantasy to that plot uh-huh. that that I wasn't going to have that kind of success. Kelly LeBrock was not going to come out of the computer, <laughs> uh, but uh, I did think that computers were pretty darn great. And that, you know, I think back to that era, right? The mid to late eighties when the home computer was just starting with like the Commodore 64 and the, Oh, uh, you know, the, I guess that was the ultimate home computer. I had a Commodore Amiga, which was a, it was a step up from that, but. Oh, really? Yeah. And, uh, but there were, it was just a magical time. You felt like you could almost do anything with a computer if you knew how. So there was that element to it. I think that's what he was tapped into. But I think, uh, you know, I knew, I knew that that was, that was a bit of a fantasy. Uh, but it was a fun one, right? And it had a, a great uh, title track by uh, Oingo Boingo that mm-hmm. uh, just played incessantly in the late 80s. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great movie, uh, lots of fun, and I I am a big fan. Actually, was a big fan of the uh, television show that was. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw the uh, Weird Science television show. Ran for like four or five seasons on the USA Network. Uh, Vanessa Angel took over the role of the. I'm trying to remember the name of what her Lisa. character was. Lisa. Lisa, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was. I, of course, I did think that there was a little bit of fantasy involved with the, uh, with you know, making a girl come to life. I didn't think that was true, but it really was a time where if you didn't know about computers, you really thought a lot of stuff was possible if you could just yeah. get your hand on a computer. And I think war games fed into that as well. Oh you yeah, know, for sure. That uh, um, you know, being able to change your grades and stuff. And I don't know if you're a fan of, do you ever watch the eight bit guy? No. Oh yeah. I have seen him. Yeah. I I've tried to get him on the program before. I, he's hard to get a hold of. I've messaged him and stuff, but he does reviews of like com- old computers yeah. and what they're capable of. And he, he did, he did his lectures too on it. And he said that the, um, um, that the stuff that happened in, in war games, as far as changing your grade was not really that impossible if you could get the two computers to talk to each other and that was like the big thing to get the two computers to talk to each other but um but yeah i really thought that there was there was almost no limit that you could do when it comes to computers and i didn't have a home computer i had people i knew people who did and uh you know about the only thing you could do was you know play games or write papers or something like that pretty much it yeah. So you did like the uh the TV series uh, mm. Weird Science, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's that was a that was a that was an interesting TV series. I've only seen clips. I've never seen a whole episode of it. Um I thought it was actually a pretty faithful uh adaptation, you know. Of course you had just little half hour adventures, but uh pretty well done. I don't think Hughes had anything to do with it other than having again created the characters, but mm-hmm. uh it was a lot of fun to watch, and I, yeah, it wasn't one of those things that I I don't have the DVD set. I didn't love it that much. It's not like it's not like the Andy Griffith show, Star Trek, or Batman for me, right? But right. But it is a fond memory. I think that was playing in the late '80s, early '90s, if I remember right. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was '90s, but it might have been late '80s. I mean, I know it ran for five seasons. Yeah, it that, probably was early '90s. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was very. It was. It was. It was popular, and I just never caught it. As I said before, kind of when you get to the early '90s, I really wasn't watching TV as much as I was 
uh, during the 80s. But the Oingo Boingo thing, and interestingly enough, uh, Danny Elfman, I, I, now this, I'm only going off memory here. So if I say this incorrectly, you know, somebody correct me. But, you know, he was um, in his band and he said, he said something to the effect of, of he's going to be working in Hollywood exclusively because he, he toured for two years with his band and made a million dollars and he sold weird science for $2 million and he wrote it in like five minutes or something. And he says, he's never going to do, do that whole band thing again. He's strictly going, it really makes a lot more money for him to uh, just produce these songs there. But that was a great song. Yeah. And I, I th- I'm trying to think when the last Boingo album came out, but you're right. I mean, regardless of when it was, he realized quickly that he was going to make a whole a heck of a lot more money and live a way more comfortable life yeah. through soundtracks. And, you know, and he's made some over the years, holy cow, some wonderful music, both for movies and TV shows. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he's, he's one of those geniuses yeah. of being able to write music and songs and songs that really tell the story of the movie. You know what I mean? That's yeah. just, it's, it's amazing. So sure. w- tell me a little bit uh, about um, if there is a John Hughes movie that you think doesn't get enough attention, what do you think that John Hughes movie would be? Wow. it's a good question. There's a bunch of them that, Folks don't realize Hughes had a hand in. Uh, I'll I'll mention two. Okay. Uh, first one, Mr. Mom. I don't know if you knew that he wrote the the screenplay for Mr. Mom. No. Great movie. Uh, one that I probably didn't. It wasn't until years later that I realized I was watching a John Hughes movie. Uh, and then the other one is a movie that was not a hit. I think it maybe grossed 11, 12 million at the box office, but a, a really fun movie for me, which is Career Opportunities. I don't know if you've seen that one. I don't think I've ever even heard of that one. Who's in it? The lovely Jennifer Connelly. Oh, really? You know who she is? Uh, she was in uh, not Dark Crystal. What's the Labyrinth? Oh, la- oh yeah yeah labyrinth there we go yeah. that's a better way to say it and uh sh- she's the young girl in that uh, she but anyway this is a movie about this kid that uh lands not her uh the kid is played uh his name is jim in the movie but and i'm trying to think of the name of the actor i can't remember his name right now uh something wally Anyway, uh, he uh, lands a job working at overnight custodial duties in a uh, retail store, like a Kmart or a Target. I think it was a Target in the, in the movie. But I was working overnight at the same time at uh, the Kmart here in, in my neck of the woods here in Utah. And I totally identified with the being locked into the store at night and just kind of having the run of the store. You know, lunchtime, I'd go to the newsstand and get the uh, National Enquirer and catch up on all the, the rumors and gossip and uh, yeah, celebrity just, gossip. Yeah, it was awesome. But this uh, in the movie, uh, uh, this Jennifer Connelly character stows away in the store, too, or hides out in the store. And uh, and uh, just a friendship ensues, as you might expect. A cameo appearance, appearance by John Candy in the movie. He, he's the guy that, I, if I remember right, and it's been a while since I've seen this movie, but uh, hires the kid to, to work in the store. So mm. fun movie. Uh, yeah, it's one of those that lots of people don't even know about. And if they do, they don't know that it's a John Hughes movie. Any John Hughes movie that you feel is overrated that people think, oh man, and and they talk about it and you go, I could not watch that movie again. That's a tough one. Uh, There are movies that I I really don't want to watch again that are, and they, they kind of are in that later phase of John's career. Uh, Any of the, home alone movies or home alone derivative movies so not that i I enjoyed them when they first came out right i enjoyed on initial watch but i'm done with those uh dennis the menace is like almost a beat for beat uh 
ripoff of Home Alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just John Hughes ripping off John Hughes. Uh, as Hughes' career kind of moved into its twilight phase, a lot of his movies, it seemed like the actors got younger and younger. And so yeah. You've got the Home Alone movies. You've got Curly Sue with Jim Belushi. You've got the Beethoven movies. And then you've got the youngest of possible and a big flop. But uh, you've got uh, Baby's Day Out. Oh, is that a John Hughes movie? That's a John Hughes movie written by John Hughes. I will give him a little bit of credit for uh, later on. There was Miracle on 34th Street, uh, just a remake he wrote. You know, So he wasn't an original a story by him, but he did the remake for that. And I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, is there anything later on? He did. I think he wrote the script for flubber, the Robin Williams, Disney movie, which was okay. But the late nineties and early two thousands, they really were. I, I think he just, you know what? An artist has a certain amount of, art yeah in yeah material in them stories to tell uh-huh. i think john his his output uh, it it diminished if you look at like if you go into wikipedia you can see that you know the, he wasn't as prolific his it was there were they were less frequent his movies whether it was a screenplay or he quit directing curly sue was his last movie that he directed in the early 90s but it's uh I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb i'll say the one that's the one that most people will probably say oh that's ah, that's horrible home alone yeah that's my rambling way of saying no more home alone for me if i never see it again i'm fine i thought that was one of them that was you mentioned these other ones and 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 yeah they're kind of flops or really not that great movies but no one's talking about them like they're great movies either at least not too many people but home alone people are like oh home alone and for me it was just Give me a break, <laughs> kind of. You have to really take a flight of fancy to pull that movie off in your in your brain. Um, yeah, what kind of parent leaves their kid behind? It just doesn't happen. I don't care how big the family is. And one other little fun factoid about that movie, uh, although we're dissing it, I will say John Candy's still wonderful in it. Yep. And he got paid $400 for that movie. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, really and more of just a favor yeah. to John Hughes. Uh, is there anyone... I already mentioned the, the underrated one. Okay, so uh, other question I wanted to ask you. Um, is there any movie out there of John Hughes's uh, that you wish w- would they would have made a sequel? Mm. Maybe Uncle Buck. Oh, Uncle Buck, really? Okay, yeah. Love the character. I, I, I love did. the character. And uh, that was Macaulay Culkin's, I think, first appearance in a John Hughes movie. I might be wrong, but I, that's how I remember it. Uh, so maybe Uncle Buck. I think the other movies really that I loved of his, uh, you know, aside from the vacation movies, which, yeah. They made Obviously, some- they made one. I'm talking yeah. about ones they haven't. Yeah, yeah right. they didn't. <laughs> right. Uh, I think the other ones served well as a standalone, but I could see another adventure with Uncle Buck. I, yeah. I could have gone down that path one more time. My Uncle Buck gets married or something like that. Yeah, you know, that would have been fun. That would have been fun. All right. Any John Hughes movie that if they did make a part two, you would lose your mind. You'd be like, just kick the TV screen over. I I will not handle this. I will not tolerate a part two of... I'm pretty tolerant of that kind of stuff. But I think at this point, the one they might be att- tempted to do, they did a commercial with uh, Matthew Broderick a, a couple of years ago. As a yeah. Paris. <laughs> uh, and I, I, if that, around that same time, I think there was r- whisperings and uh, potentially getting the gang together again for an updated adventure of them being older. Uh-huh. Uh, nah, I nah. think that's Ferris Bueller's day off is one of those movies where it's just perfect mm-hmm. as it is. And if and they made a part leave two it alone, there's yeah. no need for a part two. They did uh, a Ferris Bueller TV series. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, I don't. Not great. Oh, no, no, I do. Cause it kind of ran parallel to Parker Lewis. Can't lose. They, did, uh, they had two. I do remember that. Yes. And Jennifer Aniston was in it. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I think I watched one episode and I watched maybe, and I was kind of gravitated more toward Parker Lewis, Lewis Can't Lose than I was gra- gravitated toward the Ferris Bueller one. But I do remember that now that you mentioned, okay, a couple more questions. Got to mm-hmm. ask you if they did a, re- if they did a reboot of a John Hughes movie, which one I already did a reboot of vacation, but that aside, the ones that they have not done a reboot of yet, if they did a reboot, which movie would you be happy they did a reboot of and which movie, like basically retelling the story with the same, you know, with the, with different actors or something like that, a reboot, which one would you be most excited about and which one would you hate the most? I don't know if I'd be excited about any of them. Maybe weird science. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good choice. I think if there, if there was a reboot, like to to tell the story again, I think, I think that it would probably be the one that would, that I would, I would say you could do that. I wouldn't love it, but I could see, I could see a reboot of that. Yeah. I hate the most. I mean, I think it still goes to, I I just don't want him to touch Ferris Bueller's day off. I I love that movie. I think it's great. Planes, trains and automobiles would be another one. I wouldn't want him to touch. No, they already rebooted that. They Planes, rebooted and automobiles. No, they didn't. Yeah, with uh, it's the same movie except for it's got Robert Downey Jr. in it and Zach Galifianakis. I forgot the name of it, but it's basically the same show. It's I, I don't I, I know you've seen you've had to have seen. I it. haven't seen it now. I know which movie you're talking about. But I forgot I had the name no of the movie. No clue that that was. It's not a reboot officially, but that is straight for straight, almost a rip off. Yeah, I haven't seen that movie. I, I. Uh, it's a good movie. It's funny. It's a little more edgy than Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Yeah, yeah. It was. A, it's an R-rated. Well, both of them are R-rated movies, actually. Although Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is just a. It's a. It's a light, light R rating for sure. Yeah. There's one scene where Martin goes ballistic that causes the rating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that movie, so but you sound it was very much influenced, is what you're saying. It is Flames. the same. It's I mean, it's it's I can't even believe. I, I I mean, I'm wondering if they have to pay them royalties because it is such a rip off of that show. It's still an okay show. I I mean, I'd watch it just to, to say you've watched it, but um, I'll have to check it out. It, yeah, what's the? Did you look it up right there? You, I haven't. Let me see. Oh, let's sorry. Look, okay, I didn't. I forgot see, the name of it. Looking up Robert Downey Jr. Let's yeah, Robert Downey Jr. and Zach and Gal. Let's see him. Is it filmography? Robert Downey Jr. filmography, and this mm-hmm. would have been in the two thousands. Yeah, uh, Zach Gal. Due date. Is it due date. Yep. Yeah, it's due date. Yeah, it's due date. Follows a man who must get across the country to Los Angeles in time for the birth of his child. Yeah, so he's the Steve Martin character. Yep, and Galifianakis is the John Candy character. Yeah, it's uh, it's the same. It's kind of like Black Sheep is the same as Tommy Boy, <laughs> except for you know that yeah, it's almost the same movie. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's it's they're super similar shows. Um. A little shout out here. I want to say a couple things about uh, Pretty in Pink. I loved Pretty in Pink. I thought mm-hmm. John Cryer did a good job. Uh, also loved John Cryer in a couple other movies that he did. That, hiding uh, Out. Hiding That's Out. one I watched recently too. Great it's movie. great, great movie. Some Kind of Wonderful was pretty oh, good yeah. too. Uh, and basically Some Kind of Wonderful was Pretty in Pink, except for roles are reversed and the girl gets the guy at the, the girl. Yeah, the guy gets the girl at the end. Of, the girl gets the guy. The geek gets the, the one that they're pining after rather than losing out to somebody else. Love those shows. All right. Final segment of the show. This is a new segment that I've introduced, and I'm going to make every guest go through this at least once, and you have to do it more than one time. But in light of the fact that there is only one blockbuster left in the whole wide world, and in light of the fact that going to the video store was such, such a big part of our lives. I mean, it was so, it was so it's impactful. I mean, you, I mean, you'd have to, you know, to go to the video store or go there on a Friday night or a Saturday and be able to choose movies to bring home and watch that you didn't have to wait for on HBO or anything like that. You know, you, you, uh, we have to share a video store story with me and okay. our audience. If you've got I have, one, I have multiple. 
Um, oh yeah, you can share as many as you want. Hey, well, but I'm only going to share one, okay. and it's not really a story. It's it's um um a feeling, a moment. So when I did get back from serving my mission, the the crusade, let's call it, when I returned from the crusade, uh, there was a little video store in Bountiful, Utah, called Top Hat Video. And Top Hat Video, what they would do at nine o'clock, they closed at ten every night. At nine o'clock, all the videos would be fifty cents. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. So, I mean, fifty cents is like a buck now. Yeah. But for maybe even a buck and a half. I don't know what, how that money changes, but it's you know, like happy hour due to inflation. But but it seemed super cheap because if you remember initially, renting videos wasn't a cheap adventure especially if you didn't have a vcr there were at first we were renting out the player and the videos and we were spending 30 40 bucks to have three or four videos for the weekend yeah. but anyway this for me when my uh when i got back and up through even the early years of my my marriage in the early 90s that was our form of entertainment was we, we would wait until nine o'clock along with a lot of people in Bountiful, Utah. People in Bountiful, <laughs> Utah must be very, very thrifty because everybody would just kind of mill around the, you know, the store waiting, waiting, waiting. And then nine o'clock would hit and then you just grab the movie that you were hoping would still be there. And uh, just really fond memories of that video store and you talked about the last blockbuster i believe it's located it's no longer located in a five point five points mall it's in a it's in another location uh in bountiful but uh i believe it's still around i think they're still they've somehow managed to survive probably because they did great things like that and build a great community mm. Still around, probably won't be around much longer, but uh, shout out to Top Hat Video in Bountiful, Utah for decades of service to movie going nuts such as myself. Right, right, right. I remember uh, the, having to rent the, the VHS player as well, or the beta player when that whole fiasco happened. Uh, I told uh, one story about how. At one night we got three videos. We've got we got my mom picked one kind of for the family. My stepdad picked one for his for his pick, and then I picked one for me. And my and and uh, we watched the video as the family video. I went to bed. They were supposed to watch Legal Eagles. That's what they were supposed to watch. Because then the next day I I got home from school, started to play my video. My stepdad came home ejected my video, put in legal eagles, played the rest of it, wrapped up the video player and <laughs> on all the videos and took it back to the video store. And I was never able to finish. Horrible. <laughs> what was your movie? Do you remember your movie? I don't. I don't. I remember legal eagles though, till the day I die. <laughs> you, Robert Redford and Daryl Hannah and Deborah Wiener. All right. Well, thank you, Dave, for joining me on uh, this episode of Retro Serial. Hey, if you're out there and you've, you're one of those strange people who have subscribed to me but haven't subscribed to Dave, you're missing out. It's the good stuff, Dave Sundstrom. I would love his stuff. Go over there and check it out. And if you're listening to this and you haven't subscribed to me, please do so. It would just mean yeah, the world to me. Subscribe to Ian. Come on, people. <laughs> yes. Uh, button. Do it yeah. now. Yeah, if you are listening on podcast, please give me a, a five star a rating or an honest rating and review. And that would mean a lot to me too. Share it on your favorite social media. If you want to part with some of your hard earned cash and make all of my wildest YouTube dreams come true, there is a link below to the Buy Me a Coffee page where you can part with some of that uh, forementioned cash. Uh, and uh, what else can you do? Well, you can hit the button, the, the notification button, if you want to know when these things come out. We have lots of good stuff. If you're listening to this on podcast only, please 
go over to YouTube and if you like what we're doing here, you're going to love what we're doing over there. There are more stuff on YouTube that just kind of doesn't transfer over to audio only for podcasts. So I do like top five lists and abridged histories and stuff like that. So um, head on over there too if you be a fan all, all around. But hey, no matter what you're doing, I'm just glad you're listening. Thanks everyone. And we will talk to you again on another episode of Retro Serial.